David, thank you so much for coming on Outside the Box. Thanks, Janine. My pleasure. Well, I heard about you. I think I saw you on LinkedIn. Um, your, your book, the latest book is The Soul of an Entrepreneur. Is that correct? Yeah, it came out um, toward the middle of April. Isn't it interesting? I think your book is so timely, which is why I wanted you on the show. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the question I get the most is what's it like releasing this book in the middle of this pandemic? And yeah, uh, yeah on the face of it, I mean, it is terrible, right? You know, the, the things that normally would happen as an author, uh, releasing a book, and this is my fourth book, so not my first rodeo. Um, it's just all been thrown to the air, you know, everything from the fact that the publisher, you know, takes twice or three times as long to ship books to stores, to ship books to press. I mean, people we would usually send copies to were like, look, you want a PDF? We'll get your yeah. PDF. But like, right. there's, you know, half the people are working at the warehouse and it's, it's going to take a lot longer. Um, to obviously all the media and that I was typically doing, you know, I would do radio interviews and all of that's just COVID coverage. There's not really room for book talk anymore. So, um, so, so much has just been eaten up. And of course, book tour, that, that's not happening. Yeah. Um, but on the other sense, it's been really interesting because the topic that I'm writing about, which is in a way, reclaiming the deeper meaning of entrepreneurship and really focusing less on the sort of Silicon Valley style heroic entrepreneurs that have become the mythology around uh, American entrepreneurship over the past decade and, and focusing more on all the other entrepreneurs that make up 99% of the people who own and operate businesses out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your, your personal coaches as you are, uh, or my yeah. wife is, you know, uh, authors, people who own restaurants and stores, people who own surfboard shops, you know, you're there in, in Orange County. Um, uh, all these businesses that make up the fabric of our community and because of what's been happening over the past two months, as those businesses have faced tremendous economic challenges, unprecedented, it's made sort of the topic more relevant. So um, in a way, it's kind of been the, the perfect time for this book to come out. I just have to let people know that it exists, which is the challenging part. Well, I would think that radio shows would want a diversion and have you on yeah. because yeah. one of the reasons I decided to do this series is because I wrote my book, and I thought, well, okay, yoga, meditation, great, self-care, super important right now. However, that's not going to get somebody a job. And somebody might say, okay, I want to work remotely. And someone else might say, I want to do my own thing. And that's yeah. where you come in. Because I know people, one, one girl in LA who's launched this, um, this uh, cake delivery business, which is hugely successful right now in As all kinds of be. businesses, right? Yeah. They're people up. I want one. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, that's, it's the timing of your book is fantastic. So I think it's a, it's a plus. What would you say are the skill sets of somebody who's going to go work on their own? Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting, you know, because I think we have a, a, a mythology around what an archi um, archetypal sort of entrepreneur looks like. It's a mm -hmm. brilliant, bold, aggressive, usually young, usually male individual. And they're, they're a type A and they're a go-getter. Um, and entrepreneurs vary wildly. I mean, I know some real slacker, stoner types who went on to become great business people. You know, a lot of my friends who were kind of terrible at school went on to become great entrepreneurs. Sure. Uh, there are people who balance their time with their family who are, are very good entrepreneurs and happy and successful. And there are people who, you know, they have to live and breathe the office and that's all that matters. Um, so there, it doesn't fit one type. Anyone can do it. I think that the two things that I tell people are um, inherent to all entrepreneurs and are the two things that really the only two things you're guaranteed, right? You're not guaranteed money. You're not guaranteed success. You're not guaranteed fame. You're not guaranteed happiness. Um, you're guaranteed two things, freedom and risk. Freedom is the ability that when you work for yourself, whether it's as a freelancer, as I do with no employees, or whether you create your own business and run it, within the constraints of that, you are free to take the decisions of how you want to work 
and apply those to what you're doing. And that's everything from the color of the paint that you put on the walls, to the dress code that you have, to the products you sell, to the values that you put into that job and, and the workplace that you create. Um, you have the ultimate decision-making power. And so you get that freedom. Uh, along with the freedom though is the cost and that cost is risk financial risk which is something we're obviously seeing playing out right now across every sector of the economy but especially service businesses you know businesses that are directly interacting with the public i mean the risk has come home for everyone even and this is an unforeseen risk nobody predicted this um but also the other risks the risk to your ego the risk to your personality the risk that you and your work get so tied up together with your identity that you lose sight of other things that might be more important, like family and friends and relationships and, and you know, mental and physical health. Um, but these are the risks that come along with that freedom. And so, you know, for anyone who's thinking, okay, well, I lost my job or I'm stuck at home or I'm dissatisfied or I need something, maybe I should become an entrepreneur right now. You have to ask yourself, you know, what would I do with that freedom? How would I use it? Is that something I genuinely want? And do I want it so much that I'm, I'm willing to accept the risks that come with it? I'm going to do my best to manage those risks, but I, you know, I, I need to know that those risks are, are going to be there and I can deal with them. And the risk is why, you know, only about one in 10 people, at least prior to this crisis uh, in America became entrepreneurs in some sense, uh, because, the idea of that risk was too much and the security of, you know, a paid job and a salary job as an employee um, seemed more convenient. That, you know, now is, is on one side, you know, if you have a good job, you're probably not going to leave it in this economy. But on the other, you know, you know that now most jobs are fairly tenuous because That's of true. the situation we're in. And if you no longer want to go back in an office again and you want to work remotely and that's not an option. If you like the feeling of those sweatpants. Yeah. <laughs> how could you ever go back to slacks? How is anyone ever going to go back to like no idea. work wear? No way. I, I think this is a really interesting time where people are going to peel away the layers of who they really are. Mm -hmm. I had this conversation with somebody else earlier and discover who they are, uh, really tune into the relationships, whoever's in the house, because um, it's a lot of balancing. I mean, I'm thankful my kids aren't really young because I don't know how people do it with work and little kids and no babysitters and eek. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it, the, the lines are blurred. And I think what, what people have to realize is, and what entrepreneurs know is, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, even in the best of times, in normal times, the lines are blurred too, right? You're the first person to arrive at the office. You're the last person to leave. You don't get to switch off your work brain at 5 or 6 p.m. when you go home and have home time and work time. You know, you go home and you're always thinking about work. It was really interesting. My wife, um, almost three years ago, uh, left her job as, a, as a, a corporate headhunter and started a career coaching business. And you know, all of a sudden she'd be up in the middle of the night and like writing things down on a scrap of paper and having these ideas. And it was just this constant process that was fulfilling, but it, yeah. it's, it's very hard to, to separate that. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it's funny. It's, I, I say, you know, this period for, for, for people who are self-employed, for people who are entrepreneurs, for people who work from home, like, it's like, oh yeah. I mean, I'm just, you know, sitting around in my home all day in my sweatpants, um, trying to figure out what to do next, unsure of how much money I'm going to make this year. Like it could be this crisis. It could be three years ago. It's, there's true. an element of that. That's the Very same. True. I can relate to your wife though, because I feel like I'm probably working harder and thinking more about different things. And I put this series together in the past few weeks, it came together and I thought there's a need here and I'm not going to charge anybody for it. And I just want to do this because I, I could help someone or a few people. Great. And that's what happens when you get so excited about something, you're so passionate, you get up right. at 4.30 in the morning. And that's the freedom, right? Yeah. That's the intoxicating part of entrepreneurship is you know, you didn't have to go to the head of the studio and the programming manager and they had to move it up to regional and network or whatever to ask yes. permission to do this. You're like, I'm just going to do it and I think it's a good idea. And, you know, 
am I going to lose money on it? Maybe. Am I going to make money on it? Maybe. But I want to do this, so I'm going to do it. I have that freedom, and you're willing to take the risk that it wouldn't work out. It'd be a waste of time. You know, it wouldn't lead to things you're going to do, but you did it anyways. Yeah. And that, that freedom is the intoxicating part of entrepreneurship. That that's what draws people in. It's not the money. It's, it's, I mean, it's, occasionally it is, but for most entrepreneurs I speak with, it's never, oh, I dreamed I could do it and make, you know, billions of dollars. It's like I had an idea and I just had to go for it. It was what, it was keeping me up at night. It was so, so, you know, driving um, that it's something I had to pursue, regardless of how big that idea it is, what it, what, what that idea is, that that's, that's a thing that links all entrepreneurs together. Well, and you can see the excitement in someone when they're, yeah. You know, when I wrote my book, I was so excited because it came from a, a radio show. And I just, people can and see And an that. incredible name for like everybody. I mean, if I ever published a book called Get the Funk Out, <laughs> just, I love it. Sometimes Sorry. there's a double take. Get the funk out. Did you say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. And I, as I said, I want you on that show too. That'd be great. So uh, tell me some key things in your book, The Soul of an Entrepreneur. Well, what the book really looks to do is examine the myth of entrepreneurship and sort of restore it a bit back to reality. You know, we have this belief really crafted over the past 15, 20 years um, that it's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. It's never been easier to be an entrepreneur. There's never been more entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and, and an idea of what an entrepreneur looks like, a young, brilliant individual who creates you know, stunning innovations and gets incredibly rich. And um, the reality, which I, which I sought to sort of actually talk about, is you know, that's a very narrow slice of entrepreneurship, but it's not reflective of, of what's happening out there. You know, as much as we say it's a golden age for entrepreneurs because we look at how much someone like Mark Zuckerberg makes and, and what they do, you know, in America, people are um, half as likely today to become entrepreneurs as they were 40 years ago when I was born. The rate of entrepreneurship is about half. The rate of business startups is, is declining. The rate of growth of those new new and small businesses is lower. The amount of people they employ is lower. Um, so in many ways, you know, when you look past the shiny WeWorks and what's going on in San Francisco and in parts of Venice Beach and, um, and other sort of bright spots that we focus on in the media and in culture, entrepreneurship's actually been quite troubled. And, and then we look at actually who the entrepreneurs are, right? It's not brilliant 20 year olds who are dropping out of Stanford. The, the average entrepreneur, even in the tech sector, uh, is 45 years old. And that includes a lot of people in their 60s and even 70s who are working because they have experience and knowledge and contacts to apply. Um, but again, they're not pretty young faces, so they don't make it onto the, the cover of, of, uh, of, of business magazines and lofty profiles. No one's making biopics about them. Um, you know, the fastest growing, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yet, yet. Uh, the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the United States, again, is not brilliant young guys from Stanford and Harvard. It's minority women, African-American women, Latino women, Asian-American women, Native American women. And yet we don't hear their stories. We don't see that reflected because they get a tiny percentage of funding. And I'm not talking about venture capital funding. I'm talking about bank loans. I mean, they get no support, right? So their businesses, while they're starting them, greater numbers are growing them, they're not getting any funding for them. Um, and that makes those businesses struggle even more. And there's a lost opportunity there, not just for economic inequality, but um, as an investment, right? As supporting something that can actually do well, which is what entrepreneurship is supposed to about, be about. Even the idea of you know uh, entrepreneurship and that startup style is this great meritocracy. Can you guess in, two years ago, what percentage of venture capital funding in the United States went to companies led by women? I'm going to say it's such a small percentage. Just guess. 20%? Maybe, maybe around there or lower? 2.8%, oh. which is in 2018, the year that that's, that statistic came from, the all-time high for venture capital funding as a percentage to, to, to companies led by women. Um, and the same is true for minorities. And, you know, if you're a minority woman, I mean, it doesn't even register. So 
so all these myths about this golden age of entrepreneurship really were obscuring the fact that, that actually there's been a lot of difficulty and trouble in that. And now we're seeing that exacerbated in this crisis, which of course is hitting those very same groups of people who've been yeah. left out of that story much harder. Women who have to now try to keep their business going while taking care of their kids at home um, and had less capital to rely on minorities who are getting a tiny percentage of the government loans and assistance that are going to you know, large companies like the LA Lakers, for example, um, that, that struggling small business. Mm-hmm. Um, team-wise, yeah, they, they haven't been doing as great, but I'm saying that because I'm from Toronto and we're still the champions, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> give me something, world. Give me something to cling on to. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what the key lessons really from the book is like, look, we think entrepreneurship, we've been taught and told and, and, and sort of whipped ourselves up into a frenzy that it looks like this one thing. It looks like, you know, a young man at a, at a university creating this wild invention, standing on a stage saying, I'm going to change the world and getting showered with millions of dollars of venture capital funding. And that's true, but for a very small percentage of people. And what it actually means is anyone going out to work for themselves in the way that they feel right. And the, and what matters for them and the success for them is all sorts of different things. It could be like an immigrant, a way to start over a new life for like someone now who's lost their job. Um, for someone who wants to build something in their community in a way to help that community and strengthen that community and invest back in their community. It could be someone building a business along the lines with their values or maybe working with a family business um, that they have grown into in order to revive it and, and build upon a legacy. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really about looking at the why of entrepreneurs more than the how. It's not a book about how to start a business or how to succeed. I don't know. I'm not going to tell anybody how to do that. Um, I could, you know, struggle, struggle myself to do it. But why, right? Why do people do this? Why do they go out on their own? Why do they continue to work on their own when statistics say the odds are against them? When, you know, on average, you'd be better working off for a large company. Um, you know, economically and, and in terms of your time. And yet people still do it um, because there's something deeper there. And so that's what. Right. I was going to say, my dad had nine careers. I mean, he had so many accountants to in working in the garment district to um, construction, on and on and on. And he just wanted to be his own boss. He wanted to call the shots and he had so many different interests. And I think you also, I know you have to be super resilient. Because when things bomb, you have to figure out what's your pivot, where are you going next? Right. And that's a skill set right there. Well, because they also bomb for you, right? If you work at a company and you release the latest product and the product bombs, you know, your job's on the line, but you either keep that job or you lose it. That's kind of it, right? And you can always blame it on Susan in accounting or Fred in marketing or, you know, the head office with their big ideas or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but when something bombs for you, you, you really feel it personally as an entrepreneur. You do. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, you, you have no choice. You can't just say, well, you know, I'm still getting my check, so I guess I better figure it out. It's like, all right, that bombed. What next? I think one of the great things that um, we've seen over the past two months is how incredibly resilient entrepreneurs are. I mean, I have a friend, this guy Daniel in Toronto, where I live. Um, very, very smart guy, very passionate entrepreneur. And years ago, you know, loved to travel, loved to do sports, snowboarding, surfing, whatever. Started a tra- adventure travel company, and he does it with university students and high school students. Takes them all over the world on adventure trips, summer camps. Yes, Boom! Sir. That's that's dead, right? That business is dead. Yeah. For now, it'll come back. And, you know, I see on Facebook like a week ago, he's like, okay, I've started a company. I'm doing backyard gardens. You know, you're hungry. It's, it's, you know, finally spring here in Canada. I mean, finally, it was like snowing on mother's day. (laughs) Um, You know, we will build a garden in your backyard. I have all the people who worked at my camps. We're going to go around the city. We will plant the stuff. We will tend it every day. We will not go into your house. We'll enter through the side. You'll have lettuce. You'll have tomatoes. You'll have cucumbers. Here's the prices. Here's the thing. Like, boom, this is what I'm going to do. 
you know, the coffee shop that's like, okay, we're now doing delivery. We're doing curbside pickup. The restaurants are like, we're going to make you meal delivery kits. And we're going to have our sommelier pick out 10 wines. We're going to do a tasting thing. Again, all of that comes from that one, that resilience, right? But two, yeah. that freedom of like, all right, we don't have to ask permission to do this and we have to do something. So like, what can we do? You were like, okay, I'm not going to sit around and wait. People need this show. I'm going to make this show. Let's do it. Who am I going to ask for? Janine? Yes, Janine. Can I do this? Of course you can do it. You're asking me. Boom, done, right? <laughs> and that's, that's that is that essence of, of, of what real entrepreneurship is about. It's not, you didn't say, okay, now I just have to go pitch to like eight venture capital investors. That's right. Um, you're like, to heck with it. I'm going to do it. And watch this. Even if one or two people said, what kind of show is that? Yeah. I still would have done it. <laughs> of course. You know? Because it's, you have that, you know, it, there's a great um, entrepreneur that I, that I interviewed for this book. His name's Seth Nitschke. He's uh, up in uh, the Central Valley, in the San Joaquin Valley in, in, um, in Turlock, California. And uh, he's a rancher, runs a one-man grass-fed beef business called Mariposa, um, Mariposa Ranch. Uh, they make delicious, delicious beef. If you're hungry, they'll ship all over California. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a one man operation. It's a struggle. And Seth, uh, we were talking about the struggle of the everyday entrepreneur. And I said, what keeps you going? You know, the bank denied the loan for the mortgage. You couldn't buy the ranch and you know, it's, it's causing all sorts of trouble and you're in debt, but you're not sure how to grow or, you know, he's, he said he was like, he felt like he was stuck at Omaha beach between the, the water and the, the guns and not sure what to go. Right. And he's like, but you got to keep moving. I was like, why? He's like, well, you know, he's like, I'm not a religious guy, but it's about faith. He said, if we can't have faith in ourselves, what can we have faith in? And I think that's it, right? Entrepreneurship is fundamentally an act of faith that you must renew every single day because every day, you know, you're going to be presented with challenges. Um, yeah. And that that resilience is, you know, it's not a hashtag. It's it's real, uh, which is why I think the work that you're doing with your book and, and the show is incredibly important. And I'm not just saying that to flatter you so you put me on the next show. <laughs> <laughs> I do mean it. <laughs> um, well, it's, that show came from a place of um, being genuine. And I think when things come from your own personal life, um, it's easy to believe in them and want to perpetuate an idea, even if people tell you, oh, that's a crazy idea. You know, you're just, as you know, you just become passionate about it. I actually pulled up your um, other books you've written, Save the Deli, right? Yes. Uh, the Revenge of Analog, The Tastemakers, uh, Save the Deli. Can we just, how did that come about? You know, that was, a, that started out as a paper I wrote in, in uh, university um, oh. about Jewish delicatessens and the sociology of them. Uh, it was a easy way to get an A in a paper and have you been go, to the New York Deli? At, was it Second Avenue Deli? The yeah, I wrote about the Second Avenue Deli yeah. closing and then reopening. Um, and so it was, you know, that's kind of got me into the interest in entrepreneurs in a way, because every one of those Jewish deli owners, um, when I interviewed 200 and something of them, I drove from Toronto to Los Angeles to Florida and back, stopping along the way. Um, didn't make it as far down as, as Irvine, but uh, from when my brother lived there, I don't think there's too many places. I don't think so. Um, but Langer's, Nate Nals, Cantor's, you know, LA, I, I spent a good week there. Um, and everyone behind those businesses was an individual and a family. I mean, those, you know, the, the great thing about a Jewish delicatessen is like, what's your last name? Apostrophe S. Boom, put it on a sign. Like, right. that's it. It's their lives and their identity, their emotions were so personally tied to these businesses, um, which now are, are, are really, you know, fighting for survival. And it, it really got me, you know, interested in that, like that relationship between people and their work, mm -hmm. um, especially people who own their work. Yeah. But the key, especially right now, um, is really to have that balance, like you said earlier, because it's so easy uh, to, you know, put your health and your mental, physical, emotional well-being to the wayside and just focus on being so focused. Yeah. Neglected. You got to crush it. You got to, it doesn't matter. You don't have time for family. You don't that's have time crazy. for this. It's like, it's no, that's not, it's not a realistic thing. It's not the way that, right. you know, 
most entrepreneurs I know want balance in their life and they want family um, because it's not a game. And I think that's the biggest part of that startup myth is that entrepreneurship is a game with a beginning, middle, and an end, right? You have a brilliant idea, you get up and pitch it, you grow, 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 grow as fast as you can with as much investment capital as you can get. You dedicate every second of your life to this thing and then you sell it. You IPO, you sell it to Google, um, or you go bust, you start again. And most entrepreneurs I know are like, no, 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 no. I'm doing this because I want a life. I have a family. I have kids. I have a house. I like to go surfing on the weekends or skiing or, or play bridge or mahjong or whatever. I want to go travel. Like every entrepreneur's reality reflects who they are as an individual in their life. And, yeah. um, and that builds, you know, what they're doing and they can build their business around it. I mean, that's, again, that's the one thing you get. You're not guaranteed the money. You're not guaranteed the big sale. You do guarantee that you can set your own hours. You do guarantee where that you can have that business and what you get to wear to it and how you treat people and, you know, when you get to go home for dinner. I mean, that's, that's the freedom that entrepreneurs have. Right. So I know we have to wrap up soon, but any last bit of advice for someone right now who is out of work that is, has facing two roads, I'm going to work remotely or maybe I should start my new thing. Yeah. I, I think if, you know, if you have an idea for something and you, and you've wanted to scratch that itch now is a time to do it, especially if you have no other easily available option to you. And I, I don't imagine the job market is, is bristling with offers right now. Not that I've ever applied for a job in my 18 years of working life. Um, uh, but you don't have to have a giant, crazy, wild, brilliant idea. Like your friend in Los Angeles, do you know how to bake cakes? Great, find a way to sell them. Do you wanna have an idea and have conversations? You could start a podcast too. You know, do you have a service or good that you either produce or distribute or can give that, that someone will pay money for? Then you can be an entrepreneur. It doesn't take much. Start small and see where it goes. Um, the risk is not that huge. I also mentioned this earlier. If you are very knowledgeable in a specific subject matter, you can go teach online. You can create a course. It doesn't take a lot and do a course on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that now is this fervent time for experimentation. Um, uh, and I think you're going to see a lot of entrepreneurs coming out of this, you know, somewhat out of necessity. But uh, even in necessity, there's tremendous opportunity. You bet. So where can people find out more about you? Uh, I mean, if you want to hear my um, silly jokes and whatever, uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at SaxDavid, S-A-X. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the book contains all, everything I just said and so much more in much better edited um, <laughs> pages. Okay. Uh, and uh, you can get it wherever finer books are sold, but I would highly recommend that you contact your local independent bookstore. Uh, I don't know what that would be in Irvine or um, around Orange County. No, we have them. Okay. If there's a favorite, you can give them a shout out now. Okay. Uh, uh, and, um, and support, you know, the entrepreneurs in your community because you can buy books from anywhere, but, um, you know, only a bookshop is actually going to anchor your community. It's going to be a destination where you can go. It's the place that you could take your kids and read for story time in the back, or we'll order you a special copy of something. Um, you know, we've got to remember the businesses and the entrepreneurs behind them. They're more than just input signs in the economy. They're, they're the fabric of the places we live. So true. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for calling in. Oh, thank you, Janine. This was such a pleasure to see sunny California on the Zoom call. <laughs> I just see the sun. I was like, oh yeah, right. I remember that place. It's always sweet. I'll send you some pictures. Yes, send me some sun and a taco or two. All right. <laughs>